your Bibles with me to the book of Romans, at chapter 8. Romans at chapter number 8. Commencing in verse 14. And I want to read through verse 17. And I want to preach about, do you know who your father is? I'm not talking about your mama. I just want to know, do you know who your father is? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Thank you, Lord. Father. The Spirit itself witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Thank you, Lord. Verse 17 reads, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. Thank you. You may have your seats. The grass withers and the flower thereof fadeth away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now, under different conditions and circumstances, that could be an extremely insulting question. Do you know who your father is? But I'm not speaking here naturally. I'm speaking supernaturally. I'm not speaking about your physical natural father. But spiritually, this is a legitimate question. Because physically, everyone has only one father. But spiritually, you have one of two fathers. Because in the Gospel of John, at chapter 8, around verse 44, Jesus told the Pharisees, you are children of your father, the devil. And the vast majority of people in the world today at this moment, are children of the devil. But thank God, those of us who have been born again are children of God. Now, there are three key words to keep in mind as we traverse through this passage of Scripture. And it's the words faith, family, and father. For it is by faith that we enter into the family of God and therefore we have God as our father. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even those who believe in his name. Now this verse in John, the gospel of John chapter 1, speaks of acceptance into the family of God. But the passage in Romans chapter 8 deals with our adoption into the family of God. There is acceptance into God's family by the new birth and then there is position in the family of God by adoption. Though both these concepts are different, they are indivisible and uniquely related one to the other. Now practically, every Christian knows that to get into the family of God, you must be born again. I wish I had a Bible reader right here. In the Gospel of John chapter 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, a learned Pharisee, you must be born again. 
But so few Christians, even who come to church today, realize what they immediately become once they are born into the family of God. Now, one of the greatest doctrines in the New Testament is the doctrine of adoption. This doctrine teaches us that not only have we been born into the family of God as children, but we've been adopted into the family of God as sons. Let me say that one more time. We've been born into the family as children, but we've been adopted as sons. Because babies cannot inherit the father's wealth. When you're a child, you are put in trusteeship of somebody else. Born again makes you a child of God, but you're not yet ready to inherit as a child. So he has to adopt you as a son so that you can be in full measure an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Which talks to us about the reality of adoption. Uh, what do we mean by the word scripturally adoption? It is a legal term. The act whereby one person takes the child of another, making that child his own, and giving to that child the same legal position and privilege as if that child were born naturally into the family. Put more simply, it means to take someone into one's family by legal process and raise him and care for him as if he were naturally a child. Now that's a legal definition. But there's also a spiritual definition. I wish I had a witness here. The Greek word adoption is actually a combination of two words. One word meaning son and the other word meaning to place. So when we are adopted into the family of God, it literally means to be placed in the family as a grown son after just being born. I still don't think I got that over to you. We are placed into the family as an adult child after just being born. Let me run it by you one more time. Are you born into the family of God? Yes, you are. Are you adopted into the family of God? Yes, you are. While initially we are born into the family, we are immediately adopted into the family. Now, let me explain the difference. Adoption is the act of God by which he gives each of his children immediately adult standing adoption is not the way you get into the family you get into the family by regeneration when someone is born again they immediately become a new person that is you receive a new nature when somebody adopts a child they can give them a home they can give them their last name. They can give them their address. They can give them an inheritance. But they cannot give that adopted child their nature. Mm. That's why sometimes I think my child is adopted. She don't act like me. She don't talk like me. Sometimes I think I pick up the wrong baby at the hospital. Uh, if, 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 if she didn't just look like me, I would think that she wasn't mine because everything I tried to put in her, and those of us who are parents know that you do the best you can to try to put everything you can in them, but they want to be around the folk that you don't want them around, and they adopt their attitude and their spirit and their mindset, and even though they are naturally yours, you sometimes can't give them your nature. But once we become a new person in Christ, 
not only do we take up a new position, but we take up a new nature. Because if any man be in Christ, I wish I had a Bible reading. He is a new creation. That, that, that's the reality. Uh, we are full-fledged adult children even though we've just been born. Uh, that's tremendously important uh, if you're going to enjoy being a Christian. I don't have to wait to get to heaven to enjoy my inheritance. Uh, I am an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. So everything that belongs to Jesus is mine. Because I was born into the family and then on top of that God wrapped my birth in my adoption. So that I can't get away because I got his nature, I got his name, I got his home, I got his wealth, I got his peace, I got his joy, I got his mercy, I got his forgiveness. I wish I had a witness here. All these blessings are mine and I just got born. Now, let's not hold you too long. There are some rewards uh, that come with this matter of adoption. Uh, there are some rewards. There are some benefits of being in God's family by birth and by adoption. I don't think I got that over to you yet. Ad birth gives us a new nature adoption gives us a new position I'm in the family twice by birth and by adoption when I'm born into the family I don't know anything yet I just got born the money is in my account but I can't access it yet because I'm not yet mature so then he matures me so that I can come into my inheritance even though I don't own a Bible. Even though I can't quote a scripture. Even though I can't sing a solo. Even though I can't teach a Sunday school class. If I just get in the family, everything that belongs to my elder brother Jesus Christ comes down to me. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me give you some rewards. There's spiritual, supernatural leadership of the Holy Spirit. The verse says, and if children, then heirs heirs of God joint heirs with Jesus Christ if we indeed suffer with him that we may also be glorified together now there are two characteristics of a true child of God on the one hand he will be steered by the Holy Spirit but on the other hand he will be submissive to the Holy Spirit. The word led in the text means to be willingly led. It means to follow God voluntarily as a volitional surrender of my own desires. Now one of the reasons some Christians doubt their salvation, quite frankly, the reason some Christians doubt their salvation is because they are living stubborn, rebellious lives. They are not yielding themselves to the leadership of God. And so the spirit will not lead you if you don't give him permission. There's no way that you can feel the assurance of the presence of God in your life by rejecting the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I guarantee you, 
that any Christian who neglects to study the word, any Christian who neglects God in prayer, I wish I had a witness here, any Christian who neglects having a quiet time every day, any Christian who neglects regular fellowship with God's people at church, any Christian who is careless about his obedience to the will of God, you will undoubtedly have doubts about your salvation. But I promise you, if you have daily quiet time with God, if you walk with God, if you stay in the word, if you fellowship with your brothers and sisters, you will have doubts to dispel the doubts that will try to penetrate the armor of your assurance. The devil can't stop you when you know who you are and whose you are. I know who my daddy is. Uh, it, it, it's right here. It, it's right here in verse number 15. Here's another benefit. He gives you spiritual, supernatural liberty. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Uh, one of the greatest differences between a sinner and a saint is this. The sinner lives in fear, but the saint lives by faith. Let me see if I can help you. People who try to control things that really is born out of fear a deep-seated insecurity. Whenever you try to control, whenever you say you are in control, that's not really true. What's really controlling is the fear you have that things will get out of control. Somebody ought to help me preach it. So you got to control your wife. Control your children. Control your Sunday school class. Control your auxiliary or your organization. Control everybody who's around you. And when you got that controlling spirit, I can already tell you folk don't want to be in your company. People will be led, but they will not be controlled. I wish I had my 730 cry. You, you, you've heard the word control freak? That's people who try to put everything under their thumb to make sure they control it and it doesn't get out of their control. That's born out of insecurity. That's a difference in being in control and being in charge. In control is about fear. In charge is about faith. I'm in charge of my house. I'm in charge at this church. And in charge means whatever comes up that I can't handle, I got faith enough to believe that God's going to work it out. Yeah. If you're in control at your house, that's because you're scared. But if you're in charge at your house, that's because you got faith enough to believe that whatever comes your way, God will take care of it. I wish I had a witness here. For years and years, I was afraid of my father because of his booming voice and his powerful presence. And to me, that spelled control, but that was born out of my fear of him because I did not know him. 
I just saw him when he came from work and he came and took care of us. I know he was a provider. I know he's the one who took care of us and I know he, he married my mother and I know he was my father and I know he was in, he was in control at our house because when he came in the room, I just trembled because I was afraid of him because I didn't know him. And you're always afraid of what you don't know. But once I got to know him, we had a loving father and son relationship and I took care of him until he died. Likewise, when I did not know God, I was afraid that every time I sinned, I was going to hell. Every time I messed up, God was going to swat me down and kill me. That's because I did not know him. But once I got to know him, it was not God controlling me. It was God's spirit in charge of my life. And when God is in charge, it's not a spirit of fear, but of power and of a sound mind. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. And so verse 15 says, I can call God Papa. That's what that word in the Aramaic means. I can call him Papa. I can call him Daddy. Daddy, I'm hungry. And he comes to feed me. Daddy, I'm tired. And he comes to wrap his arms around me. Daddy, I'm scared. And he comes to get in the presence of my enemies. Daddy, I don't know what to do. And he comes and takes me by my hand. Daddy, I don't know what this thing is going to turn out to be. And he shows up to say, stand back, boy. I got it. I got your back. No weapon sown against you shall be able to prosper. You are more than a conqueror. I wish I had a witness here. Daddy, I stretch my hands to thee. Mm. When I was when I was growing up a teenager, my father owned the dry cleaners. And uh, there was a lady named Mrs. Fontenot who did his alterations. And um, she was an older a white lady, real sweet lady. And uh, my daddy and her were friends and she did his alterations. And uh, one day my daddy sent me over there to bring some alterations. And Miss Fontenot's husband was a fierce racist. Uh, I can talk about them because they're dead. Now all of them I'm talking about is dead. Uh, he was a staunch racist. He, he couldn't stand where a black person passed. Uh, he hated black people. But my father and his wife uh, had a business relationship. And she would do his alterations and he'd pay her. She wasn't doing it for free. He would pay her to do his alterations. So my daddy sent me there to bring some clothes. And when I, I would just walk in the door because Miss Fontenot's door was always open because she was expecting me because she did my daddy's alteration. So I just walked in the door and Mr. Fontenot was sitting in there with an old friend of his who was just as no good as he. And he said, uh, boy, where you going? And I looked under the sofa. <laughs> and, and, and I raised up something on this table. He said, what you doing, boy? I said, I'm looking for that boy you're talking to. Because I was about 17, 18 years old and I was smelling myself. I said, uh, I'm not a boy. And if I was, I wouldn't be your boy. And then he cussed me out. And I went home and told my daddy. My daddy said, he, 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 he did what? He said, get in this car. We drove to Miss Fontenot's house. And my daddy pulled up and opened the door and went in and said, Mr. Fontenot, my boy said, you call him out his name. Let me tell you something. This Houston Anderson's son. And uh, the things he said you said to him, say to me. 
And he said, no, sir. No, you know, I didn't mean no harm. He said, yes, you did. He said, now, I've had a business relationship with your wife for years, and I don't have to bring my clothes here for, for them to be altered. But if you get out the way with my boy one more time, it's going to be me and you and more me than you. And I stood 10 feet tall, standing behind my dad. Say, say it again. You don't know who my daddy is. Somebody ought to help me lift this up. Houston Anderson was my daddy. And I stood behind him and said, you say it one more time. My daddy don't take nothing from nobody. Now that's my daddy, Houston Anderson. But help me to bring that up to my real daddy. When the wicked, even my enemies, and my foes come upon me to eat up my flesh, my daddy says, leave my boy alone. Anybody here knows that he that dwells in the secret place, I wish I had a Bible reader, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? There's, a, there's, there's, a, there's another benefit. Uh, there's another benefit that comes from this adoption. He says, do you realize how much God truly loves you? That he wants to have the kind of relationship with you <laughs> that you can call him daddy. I, I, was, I was in the third grade before I knew my daddy's real name. Because all I called him was daddy. You're going to help me preach this, won't you? And, and when you don't have a strong relationship with God, you come to him with a lot of these and thou's. And whereunto's and therefore's. That's proper speech. Elizabethan speech for somebody you don't know. But when you have a close relationship with God, you can talk to him like you talk to your daddy. Listen, now daddy, listen. I don't like this person that I'm about to shake hands with. I need you to give me courage to just shake hands and go on about my business. Daddy, I'm having a bad day. I'm about to cuss somebody out. I'm about to lose my mind up in here, up in here. And I need you to give me strength to make it through another day. Daddy, I'm getting ready to lay down to sleep tonight. All night, I want you to put angels around my house to keep me safe from all hurt and harm. And you can pull the covers up to your neck and go to sleep because your daddy is outside because he that keepeth thee shall not slumber. He that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. I wish I had my 730 game. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He'll preserve you going out and your coming in. From this time forth, I wish I had a witness here. He'll go to sleep with you at night. He'll wake you up in the morning. He'll give you peace and joy all day long because he's your papa. Listen. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, I think that it must be they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Jesus said, consider the birds. They neither sow 
nor reap. They don't gather into any barn, barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Consider the lilies of the field. They just grow everywhere. But Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed up like these lilies of the field. Now if God takes care of birds in the air and lilies of the field that he created, he's more than our creator, he's our father. Um, listen, we have a sweet legacy. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. A baby cannot inherit anything. If two parents die and all they have is a baby, they leave their estate to that baby, but the baby has to be under the guardianship of a trustee until he can legally inherit the wealth. But the moment you and I are saved, we immediately inherit everything God has to offer. And God offers us everything that he has. We have that wealth available to us right now. As a Christian, you are filthy rich. See how quiet you got right there? I'm not talking about that name it and claim it stuff where, where, where the righteous will inherit the, the, the riches of the unrighteous. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the moment you receive Jesus Christ as Savior, you have the riches of his grace, the riches of his wisdom, and the riches of his mercy. But beyond that, we have a future inheritance that moths cannot corrupt, thieves cannot break through and steal. I wish I had a witness here. Because the devil comes but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Uh, now this, this arithmetic of inheritance is different from the inheritance we receive on earth. Uh, my papa on earth was a rolling stone. And uh, wherever he laid his hat was his home. And when he died, somebody remember that song? All he left me was alone. You got to be over 40 to dance to that kind of music. You see, on earth, if there is more than one heir to an estate, then each heir will receive an equal share. That means that each one will get a certain fraction of the whole amount. That's an earthly inheritance. But the inheritance of heaven is not under such restriction. Every adopted child will get a full inheritance. I wish I had somebody help me. I ain't got to share my mansion with nobody. In my father's house are many mansions if it were not so, I would have told you. I got my mansion. You got your mansion. I don't have to give you a fraction of mine because when I inherit the kingdom of God, I will get in full measure everything that belongs to me. You gonna help me close this little sermon, won't you? Let me, let me kind of show you something about the, the revelation of this adoption. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. A baby does not know it's a baby. 
It doesn't even know it's a human being. That baby doesn't even know who his or her parents are. He knows very early that some people are very close to him. Somebody's always kissing him. Somebody's always holding him. Somebody's always making over him and slobbering over him. But he doesn't know who they are. He doesn't know how to call them mama or daddy. But when we are saved, God sends his Holy Spirit into our hearts to show us immediately that we are his children. The Spirit's witness is mentioned three times in the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 10 at verse 15, we are told he witnesses to us. That, that gives us the fact of our salvation. But the faith of our salvation is in 1 John 5 and 10. And the feeling of our salvation is in Romans chapter 8 at these verses I've just read. A true child of God hates sin. He longs for the return of Jesus Christ. He loves other Christians. He desires God's word. He will want to be more like Jesus and he's always trying to bring other people to the faith that he or she has found for themselves. When you know God and you're close to God, you want other people to get in the family. Let me, let me, let me, let me run this by you. You don't have to get jealous of anybody in the family of God because of what I just mentioned to us. That you don't have to give a fraction of your inheritance yeah. to anybody. You will inherit in full measure all that God has for you. So that's why you don't have to try to knock me out of the way to get anything that God has. Because if it truly belongs to you by the new birth, God will give it to you in full measure. You're going to help me close this, won't you? In the 19th century. There was a, name, a man named Billy Bray who was a bum, a, a reprobate, and he lived a life of drunkenness and debauchery. And he went into the military service, and he was poor and came from a family where he didn't even know who his father was. His mother was poor. But he went into the military and met up with this young man from the same town that he was from, but on the other side of the tracks, who was wealthy and well-to-do. They became fast friends. They were inseparable because they were from the same town but different sides of the tracks. And they were fighting in the war. And uh, one of them uh, got wounded in battle. The, the poor boy, Billy, got wounded in battle. But his friend, who was rich, was killed in that same conflict. And uh, Billy uh, held him in his arms and he was dying in his friend's arms and he took off his bloody shirt and gave it to Billy and said when you get back home if you make it through this war if you get back home go to my daddy's house and tell him that I died honorably in battle here is my bloody shirt adopt you as his son and make you an heir to my wealth you're going to help me close this won't you so when the war was over Billy went back to his town, knocked on that door on the other side of the tracks. A butler came to the door and said, your kind can't come in here. We don't receive your kind in here. Billy said, I've got a message for the owner of this house. He said, since his son died, he's not receiving any company. He's depressed and don't want to see anybody. Billy said, I've got a message for him from his son on the battlefield. The father said, let Billy come in. Billy came into the house and gave that man his son's bloody shirt. He said he died honorably on the field and he wants you to adopt me as your son and make me a full heir to your wealth. The father started crying. He grabbed Billy and hugged and kissed him because Billy had the evidence of his son's blood and so he made him an heir and a joint heir. I wish I had somebody to help me here. One Friday on the cross, 
Jesus died. Didn't he die? I took his bloody cross and brought it up to my father and said, forgive me, I have sinned. I want to get in your family. God forgave me because he saw the blood of his son. And now he's accepted me, not just as a son, but as an heir. And the riches that belong to Jesus Christ now belong to me.